Good morning, my friends. This is Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to Morning Glory, our midweek Bible study, and I am so glad that you are here today. Praise God. Now, today we're going to talk about an amazing subject that I'll title The Three Anointings of Jesus. But before we get into today's message, let me say a big thank you to everyone that remembered me and honored me on my birthday, and I received your cards. And whether it, uh, things came in online or through the mail, your precious personal offerings to me, I received them, rejoiced in the Lord over them, and I thank you so much for welcoming me into my 57th year of life on planet Earth. Praise God. Moving forward in the joy of the Lord. So thank you to everybody that remembered me on my birthday. I greatly appreciate that. Now, we're going to begin today in Philippians chapter 4. Let's move on down to verse 15. This is a big week. This is resurrection week. And I want to talk about some of the things that happened at the beginning of the Lord's ministry and also just a few days, two days before he went to the cross. Okay? So let's start in Philippians 4, 15, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we jump into your word, that your Holy Spirit would come bringing illumination, understanding of your ways, and insight into the deeper walk with you. Now, Father, we thank you for the ministry of your Spirit working right now. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we say amen. Now, verse 15. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia. Now, if we study church history and look at the timeline of the ministry of Paul, he's referring back to about 10 years previous. And he said, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, this is really fascinating, this area of giving and receiving. When there is giving, then we have sometimes been told that we shouldn't expect anything back. Pastor Stephen, it's wrong to uh, respect, uh, expect something back. That uh, pollutes the offering. Well, we always, of course, want to give out of a love motive. Faith works by love, but that still doesn't mean that we do away with this verse that talks about giving and receiving. So we want our giving to have the right motive, but at the same time, Paul here, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks about giving and receiving. Now, I want you to be excited in your spirit because it is your season for receiving. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. You know, what would you think of a farmer who kept planting seeds and then there is a harvest, and he lets the harvest just rot out in the field. And you saw him do that. What would you think of a farmer who did that? Well, you would think he's irresponsible. And I think that would be the most fitting word, an irresponsible farmer. Praise God. But we want to make sure that in the spirit realm, and also even in the natural of sowing and reaping, that we take our responsibility and receive. Because all over the world, people want to know more and more about God. People are hungry. People want to be spiritually fed. And people want uh, to hear uh, you know, good Bible teaching, but they also need like parallel stories that help put more meat on the bones. In other words, I can I can read in the Bible about the gifts of the Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit, but just by looking at that, that's going to help me, but if I can hear somebody explain to me how those gifts operate in their life and how they can give examples and demonstrations, then that's going to help me a whole lot. So all of the world, people want to know more and more about God and when we sow into the gospel, then God wants you to receive, say that word receive, God wants you to receive a harvest from the financial seeds that you plant. So this is why you need to have 
and abundance of finances so you can help finance the preaching of the gospel. And here's what's fascinating. If you plant seed, you will always be on the receiving end. I want to say it again. If you plant seed, you will always be on the receiving end. Woo, praise God. And Paul, quoting the words of Jesus, said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. But at the same time, we have to receive, and that is a part of it. Mm -mm. Glory to God. Now, look at verse 19. And my God shall supply. So that is the receiving end that we have. We're going to receive from God. And my God shall supply all your need. How does he do it? According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God supplies it. And whether God funnels it through or channels it through or sends it through different avenues of increase, the reality is, is that the source of it is all coming from God. It's all coming out of the heart of Jesus. It's coming from the riches in glory. And the riches in glory are in Christ Jesus. Woo, praise God. Now, let me give you an example of this. I was meditating and thinking about this earlier today. And, uh, you know, there in Kirjoth Jerem in Israel, only about uh, 10 miles outside of Jerusalem. You have uh, Kirjoth Jerem, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept for 20 years. And that's before David came and picked it up and took it on to Jerusalem. But while it was there, you know, it was a famous landmark, and that hill today is still a famous landmark. And there is a monastery on top of that hill today, built by Sister Josephine. It's a Catholic church and a monastery. Very beautiful place. I've been there. One of the most beautiful and peaceful places in Israel where you can sense the presence of the Lord. But when you go there today and you see the beautiful church, and I'm going to put some pictures up. You can see that now, the beautiful facility there, and the beautiful grounds and uh, uh, all of the beautiful limestone uh, design they've done in the garden area. It's amazing, but uh, it used to just be a barren hill. Now, of course, it is of extreme archaeological importance because that church is built over the site where the Ark of the Covenant sat at for the entire duration of its time there. And there's a room in that church they can take you to. Uh, One of the nuns can take you there. And if you catch them at the right time, they can take you to that room. And it's the very room uh, uh, down on the floor area. There's a rug over it, and underneath it, there is the original flooring of the same spot where the Ark of the Covenant sat. Woo! Praise the Lord. But... When you see everything that's there today, and it's like a a beacon of light up on a hill, uh, all of that, though, it cost money to do that. And when Sister Josephine had to leave Israel, she's the woman that built that beautiful church and all, she raised the money. But when World, World War I took place, she was required to leave Israel and go back to her home country of France. And so she goes back to France, and there's World War I going on. And it looked like finances just were going to dry up completely. And this vision in her heart to build the church and to establish the outreaches that are based out of that location that she has uh, ministering to many people, it looked like none of it was ever going to be a reality. Now, listen to what she said. Uh, It it writes here in her life story that during her stay in Lyon, France, when she left Israel had to go back to Lyon, France. Sister Josephine still had her thoughts and her heart preoccupied with the Basilica of Kiryat Jerem. Help for this construction came mainly from France. The news of the war was bad. The country was in a sorry state, and the worst was expected. She was thinking about all this one day while attending communion, in the St. Joseph Church in the Breteau district. She had just prayed and cried during the whole communion. 
she was saying to Jesus, the country, France, is going to be annihilated. What uh, and who can give anything towards the basilica? Farewell, basilica. It's all over, she said. On leaving the church after communion, Jesus appeared to Sister Josephine in a vision and showed her his heart. The sister reported in the vision that Jesus was seated as if on a low column, and he said to her, Why are you crying? Can the poverty of France impoverish my heart and shrink my arm? Now, I want to read that again. For all of those of you that are believing God for things, and you need provision, you need resources, listen again. Jesus told her, Why are you crying? Can the poverty of France impoverish my heart and shrink my arm? When we begin to build, this is where the gold will come from. And he showed her his heart with the stream of 20 uh, 20 franc gold coins coming out of it. Then he added, it is the purest gold of my heart for the basilica. Let me put up on the screen what one of those coins looked like. These were coins that were popular during World War I in that area of France. And uh, you can actually pick those up today. They're about $450. They're pretty small little coins, but they are pure gold. And uh, she, in a vision, saw Jesus opening up his heart, and out of, out of the heart of the Lord were coming all of these gold uh, franc coins. By the way, the ones with the, if you ever buy one, the one with the rooster on the reverse side, that's the one you want. That's the considered to be the best uh, coin. Uh, it does have some different backs, but the one with the French, with the French rooster is considered to be the best one if there's any coin collectors watching me. <laughs> so here's, here again is what Paul said. Paul said, and my God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So in the heart of Jesus are all the riches of glory in the supply for anything and everything you need. Praise God. Whether it's a building project, uh, whether it's uh, money that you need to expand your business and take it to the next level without having to plunge yourself in the debt, you're trusting God to do it while you're staying, uh, how can we say, lean and mean. You're running a, fi- a, a tight financial ship. And, uh, and uh, I tell you what, God can get it to you. God's going to help take you to that next level. And where does it come from? It comes out of the heart of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord God. So God's going to supply it. It is in his heart. He's going to release it to you. And when God releases provision, this is what's amazing. When he releases it, it comes right on time. And because it's on time, Everything synchronizes and harmonizes really well. It's like your hand going into a glove, but a really good fitting glove, not a loose floppy glove, but a glove that just fits so good. And you put that on, you feel like, yes, I'm ready to grab something and go to work. (laughs) Woo, praise God. Hallelujah. So I see a time of great receiving in your life because you have been giving. Mm -mm. It is your giving that releases the heart of God to pour forth what he has for you to receive. Now, in order to bring out uh, the startling reality of this and how God so honors giving and receiving, I want to share about the three anointings that Jesus received during his years of ministry. But before we jump into that, let me just read that one more time from Philippians chapter 4, where Paul said, now you, uh, in verse 15, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. In other words, he's saying you got involved in my ministry and you helped support this work And he also said, because of this, you are partakers of my grace. So the same anointing, the same type of gifting, apostolic, uh, evangelistic, even prophetic, uh, uh, the ability to teach and grasp the word, that grace that was on Paul 
would touch those that partnered with his ministry. Can you imagine the privilege and the opportunity to support the ministry of the Apostle Paul? Well, Pastor Stephen, I'm not really into that. Oh, I, I would be, and I know many of you would be too. You'd be like, hey, this is a privilege to sow into the ministry of the man that wrote two-thirds of the books in the New Testament. I, I'd like to partner with him. Mm -mm. Praise God. So Paul taught about not just giving, but also about giving and receiving. Praise God. Now, let's go to the Gospel of Luke, and I want you to see something uh, in Luke chapter 7 of what can be considered the first anointing of Jesus. Now, as we're turning over there, let, let me say this about the anointings of Jesus. For about the first 1,600 years of church history, everybody that was a notable theologian or a notable religious leader, whether you were Protestant or whether you were Catholic, and before Protestantism kind of developed and evangelicalism developed, long before that, there was, you know, the Catholic Church and there was other uh other streams of Christianity that were active, Eastern Orthodox, etc., so forth. But amongst all of them, there was the overwhelming agreement that the anointings that you read about in the Bible that took place to Jesus were being done by one person. Now, what happened when we moved more into seminary-type uh, education, what they would call higher education with uh, what they would call higher criticism. In other words, criticizing the Scriptures and basically saying, well, the gospel writer made a mistake. Uh, in other words, like Luke made a mistake. Uh, he obviously forgot something and got the, got the name of the town wrong, and he messed up on a few of the uh, a few of the locations and events. Uh, so obviously we're just talking about, you know, something different. But th they would even say that it was all like one anointing. But it's not true. There were multiple anointings, but it was all being done by the same person. It's a little bit similar to the, the cleansing of the temple. Jesus going in there with a whip. Jesus flipping tables over. Yes, well, that was a great event. Uh, it wasn't just one event. There were two cleansings of the temple, not just one. That's another area that scholars agreed upon for hundreds of years, that there were more than one cleansings of the temple that Jesus did. And they also agreed that there were more than one anointings. So today you have a lot of liberal theologians, you know, the ones that don't believe in the virgin birth, the ones that don't believe that there's a real heaven and a real hell, they also uh, would say, well, there's just one anointing. No, there's not. There's, there's multiple anointings in the Bible. And I want to talk about the very, very unusual outcome of this. Why? Because there's giving and there's also receiving. Let me tell you right now, God knows how to get it to you. He knows how to get it over to you. You might be on an island and you're all by yourself. You got shipwrecked and you're listening to me on ham radio or something like that. <laughs> Woo! God can get a blessing to you right there. Maybe it's getting picked up by another boat, praise God, or maybe you're enjoying your, your solitude, just you and the Lord. Well, whatever it is, though, God can get it to you anywhere you're at. So I want you to think about that as we begin to consider this. The first anointing would be Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And here we see that this anointing done by a woman for Jesus, it happens in the house of Simon the Pharisee. Now, I saw one scholar that did a study on uh, like Bible names or popular names during the era of Jesus while he was on the earth. And he found out that 15% of all men living in Israel went by the name Simon. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, one of the other gospel writers, he talks about uh, uh, an anointing that Jesus had also, and it was also in Simon's house. Uh, yeah, that's a different Simon. 
in a different town. Mm. Oh, no, Pastor Stephen, they're all the same. No, they're not the same. The Bible was written with absolute laser-like precision. The gospel writers did not make a mistake. There's not one anointing. There's multiple anointings that Jesus receives. The wild thing, the really, really wild thing that I want to bring out today is that it was all done by the same person. It was all done by one person. Woo, praise God. Oh, well, here in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 and onward, we see that this anointing was done by a woman in the city who was a sinner. Mm-mm. Well, well, Pastor Stephen, well, we look at this, we don't, we don't really know the name of the woman, do we? Well, when you study God's Word, uh, th- this is how I do it. You don't have to do it my way, but this is how I would say uh, you want to study. Not just read, but if you want to study, here's a good route to follow. Number one, y- yes, you and the Holy Spirit are working together to pull up information. But number two, you do want to go to commentaries beginning with the uh, noted evangelical scholars who would comment. Why? Because they know Hebrew, they know Greek, and you know that's all they do for full-time living. They, they study theology. So you do want to read those that had proven ministries and really had an anointing to uh, write commentaries that were rock solid. Okay, so you want to look at those trusted commentaries. And then, uh, particularly when you're in the Old Testament you're go- and you're studying, you're going to want to not only look at those uh, evangelical-type commentaries, but you're going to want to pull up the Jewish commentaries, and you're going to want to read what the rabbis said, the rabbis that were in the Babylonian captivity. They did a lot of writing. After all, when you're captive, not much else to do. And uh, also throughout the centuries, there have been some very, very noted scholars uh, amongst the Jewish people, and you want to read what they said as well. Good, Pastor Stephen. I'm, I'm done. I've got a lot of work to do. Your homework's not done yet. If you want to go further and you're spirit filled and you're Pentecostal and you're not afraid of miracles and you know that God is the God of the supernatural, I would highly encourage you to go to another realm of study and that would be look at what mystic saints wrote in their commentaries. Oh, 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 Pastor Stephen, you mean the ones that had visions, the ones that were caught up to heaven, the ones that said they had communication with other redeemed saints? Uh, Yes, yes. In their world, that was normal. (laughs) So there's one, there's one German mystic. Uh, I'll often go to her commentaries just to get her input because she was a woman that would have ecstatic visions. She would have these amazing visions and she uh, would be like a witness, like an invisible witness to things. She saw the crucifixion in, in a visionary form. You know, she'd lay in bed going to these visions and she would see things. But she saw a lot about uh, this sinner woman. And by the way, this sinner woman is Mary Magdalene. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, the German mystic, she... Uh, she told a lot about Mary Magdalene. It's not unbiblical, but it would be considered extra biblical. And I trust this woman, very, very holy, godly woman. But uh, Mary Magdalene was very wealthy and she owned a castle. She ended up owning a couple of castles. She had a lot of land and she was very, very attractive. And because of that, it led her into a life of vanity. The vanity led her further into a life of sin. There was living close by her uh, about two hum- uh, about 200 Roman soldiers, uh, Roman officials, Roman officers, and uh, it was well known that every single one of those men, hundreds of them, were very intimately familiar with Mary Magdalene. I tell you, you get over into areas like that where you just open yourself up and you surrender yourself to that world of sin and of hedonistic pleasure and all that it involves, you're going to have some demon problems. And she did. This is the woman that had the seven demons cast out of her. And here she comes crying 
and weeping at the feet of Jesus and begins to anoint his feet and begins to wipe his feet with her hair. I mean, this is like, um, this is like really on the edge for the, for those uh, customs in the New Testament era. This is this is heavy duty for a woman to let her hair down in public. <laughs> man, that's gonna like like turn heads everywhere. That was just like almost unheard of. And Simon, who's invited Jesus over, he's about to like blow a fuse, and Jesus lets her do it. And she's weeping. She's repentant. She is completely broken over. Her sins. And you'll notice also some of the unwritten things. Here, uh, the disciples are not saying, hey, you know, she's wasting that fragrant oil. You know, we could have used that for... No, no, they stay quiet. Nobody's objecting. They're not giving her a hard time at all. But this, my friends, is the Lord's first anointing. And throughout church history, the scholars, the theologians, even the mystics, they all agree it's Mary Magdalene mm -mm. in the house of Simon the Pharisee. Mm -mm -mm. Praise God. Praise God. So there is the anointing. There is the giving of that sacred thing. Praise the Lord. She stood at his feet behind him. The final anointing will be an approach from the front. She stood at his feet behind him, weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Praise God. Okay, so there is the giving of the offering of the fragrant oil. Now, number two, anointing. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 12. I'm going somewhere with this. Something that you've maybe never, ever have considered before, I want to reveal it to you, and I want you to consider it. I want you to think about it. The, um, the avenues for which this could lead, are uh, they're unparalleled. It's wide open. Now watch. John chapter 12, verse 1. We have another anointing where Jesus gets anointed again. This time in the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, where? In Bethany. Now, many people have always wondered about Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, this family that Jesus was very attached to. And people have wondered for a long time, uh, particularly over the last hundred, couple of hundred of years, was this Mary Magdalene with the sister Martha and the brother Lazarus. And I would say this, for the first 1,500 years of church history, it was a unanimous, absolutely, it is Mary Magdalene. Again, when higher criticism came along and everything just got shoved into one story. In other words, these aren't three different stories. They're just one and all the gospel writers are confused, but they're trying to make, no, no, these are different anointings and this is your Mary Magdalene. Mm -mm -mm. Praise God. This time in their home, notice with this anointing, there's no crying. And there is again, though, the wiping of the feet. No mention of the head. No mention of the head in the first anointing. No mention of the head in the second anointing. But again, the wiping of the feet. This all is found in the Gospel of John chapter 12. Look at verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Well, Pastor Stephen, she must have had a lot of money. Yeah, she had a whole lot of money. She, she previously had a whole lot of boyfriends. Mm -mm. You know, it kind of reminds me of... Um, who was that French woman in the Catholic Church? A great mystic saint. Um, she wrote The Interior Castle. Oh, it's almost, uh, some of you are probably thinking of it. Um, Madame Jean Guyon, that's right. Okay, so in her time, uh, now remember, she, she was a nun, yet everybody in Paris, because Paris was always like a socialite, vain, vanity-type city, still is, and uh, but everybody in Paris considered Jean Guyon to be the most beautiful woman in Paris, and it it was like it tormented her. Why? Because of the the area of pride. Some people say it's a beauty. Uh, she, some people say that beauty is a, is a blessing. And okay, we could say that that's fine. It is what it is. But when you want to serve God and people want to put you on a pedestal and talk about you all the time, well, it almost drove her nuts until. She got struck with uh, 
smallpox. And the smallpox broke out all over her face. And later when it was healed, they left scars all over her face. And she was uh, no longer considered the most beautiful woman. And she was like, thank God. Now I can go about my business serving the Lord without all of this arrogant, prideful vanity trying to be heaped on me all the time. <laughs> and that's from a woman covering herself, trying to present herself as a holy woman of God. But um, every blessing, uh, you have to be really, really careful that it's not turned into a curse, that it's not turned into something where it starts working against you in a very negative way. So we see here that this is very costly uh, fragrant oil. And here in verse four, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, mm -mm, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? So we, you're looking at a whole year's worth of wages. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put into it. And he was thinking this would be a really big haul. <laughs> but Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. She has kept this for the day. She knew, she knew he was going to die. He told the others and they couldn't, they couldn't get it. They couldn't grasp it. She did. Now, here Judas has a reaction. He can't control the greed and the thievery that's on the inside of him. And there's manifestations of, uh, you know, covetousness. And, but the other disciples, when they see Jesus basically say, let her alone, they, they back off. They don't say anything. Four days later, there's going to be, you guessed it, another anointing. But something happened at that anointing where not only Judas pulls his stunt again of another like ridicule and put down, but this time some of the disciples, some of the, some of the apostles join with Judas on that one. Why? He's, he's working his poison. He's working that poison poison of, of ridiculing this holy and sacred offering that she has given unto the Lord. But, but notice it didn't stop her. I tell you what, Mary Magdalene's going to do her thing and ain't nobody going to get in her way. She's going to worship God the way that she served the devil and lived in sin with passion. She's going to take all of that energy and turn it and serve God with a heart on fire like few have ever seen. Mm -hmm. I pray that some of it get on you today because <laughs> some of you, uh, you don't need to tell me and you don't need to write me a letter, but you know your background. You could say, Pastor Steve, and I could, could relate with this sister. I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling, kind of feeling the flow here. You know, a couple of months back, I was at a monastery and uh, spending the night with the monks, hanging out with them, and uh, having dinner, and you know, praying at night, and uh, having. You know, the next day, I had breakfast, and I, I had breakfast with uh, the youngest monk there, and he's, uh, you know, college graduate, handsome. Good looking guy, and he's a monk, okay? So he's not, he has no plans on ever getting married. All he wants, uh, he doesn't want to be married. He just wants to serve God and live for God all of his life. And he's still in his early 20s. <laughs> so I'm talking to him at breakfast, just he and I at the table. I said, So, um, who's your favorite saint? Now, I thought he might say, Oh, Padre Pio or um, St. Francis of Assisi or something like that. He looked at me and didn't bat, didn't bat an eyelash. He said, uh, Mary Magdalene. And when, <laughs> when he said that, it was just like he and I looked at each other and we knew. I was like, you don't have to say anything else. He basically was telling me his background, in a sense, was you know what it was. And Mary Magdalene actually reminds me a lot of St. Francis of Assisi because uh, he was wild, I, and he had a lot of money. His daddy was one of the richest people in town, and he had all the money, and he was a party animal, and he was with all the girls all the time, being immoral, and that was his life until Jesus came knocking on his heart, and he walked away from all of that, and with that same energy that he was 
serving the devil and living in the flesh, he turned all of it with a radical devotion to the Lord that when you read his life story, it's like, it's almost like, it seems like fiction, but it's not, it's real. <laughs> so you can see why in a very short time, St. Francis of Assisi had a following of over 5,000 men and women, including some of the nobility and royalty of Europe. Some of the wealthiest people of Europe said, I'll walk away from all of it to follow you as you follow Christ. <laughs> Woo! And we're going to see it again in the days leading up to the Lord's return. We're going to see people look at their wealth and say, God has only given this to me, not for the purpose of endless hedonism and partying, but so that I can now turn it and funnel it into the hands of a man or woman of God that I that God has connected me to for the preaching of the gospel. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And that's what Mary Magdalene was for Jesus, a supporter of his ministry. Yes, a devotee, oh, on a deep, deep level, a financier, absolutely. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And here she is at it again, at it again. Praise God. And she doesn't care what Judas thinks. She doesn't care what the Pharisees think. She doesn't care what the apostles think. She's going to honor Jesus and serve him with all of her heart. And that includes her offerings. That includes her finances, the giving of gifts. This one that was worth over one full year's wages dumped in one offering, just like that. Mm, mm, mm. Glory to God. And Jesus received it. My friends, you need the receiving grace. Praise God. Because some things are going to happen to you where you're just going to want to get on your face and say, Jesus, you're too much. <laughs> I, I don't deserve it. And the truth is we don't. It's grace. Uh, it's grace. And God's going to pour out such prosperity and provision on you that you will be able to fund the work of the kingdom, the way that you have dreamed of in your private talks and your private thoughts with God. Mm -hmm. But you've got to have that Mary Magdalene passion. Praise God. Uh, you've got to have that love devotion or else wealth can turn you. It can turn, it's very sneaky. It can turn you. So you've got to have that love flame devotion. Mm -mm. Praise God. And so here in John chapter 12, we see the second, the second anointing. Now, there's more. Let's go to the third anointing. And this one takes just place two days before Jesus is crucified. Mark chapter 14 I want to look at it in Mark's gospel. Now, it is also mentioned in Matthew's gospel as well, but I want to go over to the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 14. Mm -hmm. Think about all the sowing. Think about of all of the, the anointings. In these anointings, she's sowing. She's pouring out. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. She's about to really pour out here. Now, here we have a situation where she's in the house of Simon. Oh, yes, Pastor Steve, same story as Simon the Pharisee. Uh, no, this is Simon the leper. You could probably frame that in your mind a little better if you realize this is in the house of Simon, the healed leper. By the way, in order to be a Pharisee, you never could have had leprosy. Even if you got healed from leprosy, you still never could get into that religious organization. So this is definitely not at the house of Simon the Pharisee. This is a completely different anointing. This is the last one that he's going to receive just before he goes to the cross. So it is, again, in Bethany, but at a different person's house. Here, the head of Jesus is going to be anointed, this time with the breaking of an alabaster box. Again, in this one, we have an unnamed woman but throughout church history, hundreds and hundreds of years, scholars and theologians, even after the Reformation, even with Martin Luther, they all still realize there is no other person who's doing this except Mary Magdalene. <laughs> and here she is at it again. Well, Pastor Stephen, that could have been somebody else and jumped in there. No, no. All the mystics also say that who had visions and saw this in the spirit realm, saw it kind of like replayed back, like watching the DVD, watching like a Netflix rerun, but they were seeing it in vision form. They all say it's Mary Magdalene doing it again. Here she is again. Let's take a look 
And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spike nard. She thinks, uh, she thinks, well, you've criticized me for my giving thus far. You haven't seen anything yet. You, you haven't seen anything the way I'm about to pour out on Jesus. I'm about to bless the ministry of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in a way I've never done before. So if you if you want to criticize, get ready because you're about to see something because I'm in love with Jesus and I'm going to bless who he is and what he's doing. <laughs> Why? She knows he's about to die. Mm-mm. A woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some, there still are, there, there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Wasted? He's God in the flesh. Wasted? What is Wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to discern difference, the difference in people. Okay, first of all, the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. But wisdom is also the ability to discern difference in people. Can't you tell he's not a normal everyday guy? I, I know he's, he's human, he is in the flesh, but he's still God in the flesh. He's just as much God as he is man. He's the God-man. Yes, uh, let's put it all on him. This is not a waste. This is lavish giving. This is lavish sowing. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they, not just Judas, they criticized her sharply. Watch out for the criticism against prosperity. It's very wicked. It is the tongue. It is the Luciferian tongue on the loose trying to get you uh, to say something against the holy work of God so that you uh, the provision that you need is blocked or stayed. What is jealousy? What is religious criticism in these areas against prosperity? It's jealousy based on critics who are jealous because what they see of you being blessed they see that as being God's saying no to them and yes to you, and it makes them jealous. They somehow think that because God said yes to do you, it means that they've been rejected. Well, God didn't do it for me. Well, maybe you didn't sow the seeds that they sowed. Maybe you're not reaping the harvest that they've reaped or are reaping because you haven't sowed like they've sowed. And so, therefore, they get jealous and they criticize because they think they're being left out by God. But yet God has made his way of reaping a harvest available for everybody. Mm -mm. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. Mm -mm. She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached to the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So, three different anointings. And I think it's interesting to consider that there are people who give sacrificially, not just once in their life, but multiple times. I want to say that again. Pastor Stephen, I gave a very sacrificial offering in the year 2021. That's, that's good. That's good. Praise the Lord. But there's people in Scripture you can look at and you, and you dig into it. You'll find out they just didn't sometimes do it once. Sometimes they did it twice. Sometimes they did it three times. Sometimes they did it more than that. We need to consider that. But here's something that I really want to bring to light, because the Holy Spirit showed this to me. I want you to think about what was Mary Magdalene's harvest. When she's giving like this, now she's giving out of love. It's a love motive. We're not, we're not getting to get, we're not giving to get. 
This is not some kind of mechanical business like dead, dry transaction. No, this is all of our giving is done out of love while at the same time we do honor and recognize seed time and harvest and uh, sowing and reaping, giving and receiving. And yes, because that's a kingdom principle, we operate with that as well. But really, what was her harvest? I mean, what do you give a woman who's already got everything? Well, Pastor Stephen, for her harvest, God probably blessed her with the, Mer- with the Mercedes Benz, brand new. Now, she's already had all of that stuff. She's already had all that luxury watch, luxury jewelry. Uh, you, okay, okay, we know. Okay, cars and you know, watches, that stuff didn't exist back then. But anything that would have been considered opulent luxury, she already had it. She was already familiar with it. She's no stranger to wealth. So what do you, what do you give to somebody who's already got it all? How does God get a harvest? Does he just give more of the same thing? Or is there something where there's realms where you really want to harvest, maybe in a certain area, and the only person that can give it to you in that area is God? So what was her harvest? I'd like to show it to you. First of all, in Mark chapter 14 is verse 9. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So the act of lavish giving that she did, this time there was a, there was a breakthrough in the sense where this one's going down as a memorial. What is a memorial? A memorial is something that keeps alive the memory of someone. It's God saying, I'm never, ever going to allow this to be forgotten by anybody in heaven. Mm -mm. And so in heaven, there there are solid physical structures, and they're they're memorials. Sometimes they can be gigantic, very, very large. It's like a monumental memorial with writing on it that tells the day— when it happened, the setting in which it happened, and who is in honor of. So there is a memorial established in heaven for Mary Magdalene because of what she did here. And that memorial is also linked to the earth in the sense that it is being preached all over the world. And it's still being done right now through me. Praise God. As this will go all over the world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So it's still being fulfilled. So that memorial is established. Are you ready for the big one, though? Are you re- now, now listen. Get ready for this one. You, you can do things where you touch the heart of God with your love and your sacrificial giving, where God can unload some things on you that you, you couldn't buy it for a billion dollars. You couldn't buy it if you had all the money in the world. God can take you in the realms and the places of blessing that are that are eternal in nature. Mm-mm. Are you ready? All right. What was her harvest? Okay, we know a memorial, but now let's look at the big one. Mark chapter 16, and let's go directly to Uh, verse 8. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early, the first day of the week, that's this Sunday, we're almost at Resurrection Sunday. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to who? Oh, Pastor Stephen, he appeared first to Peter, because he's the man, and he's he's the chief apostle. He's the rock. No, he didn't. Oh, well, Pastor Stephen, maybe he appeared to John, John the Revelator, who would one day write the book of Revelation. No, didn't appear to John either. Who did he appear first to? He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons, and and by whom he had been anointed three times. Mm -mm. Well, Pastor Stephen, she was just lucky. She was in the right spot at the right time. No, 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 a million times no. It has nothing to do with luck, chance, coincidence. This is God rewarding her with a perpetual harvest that will shine throughout all eternity. And her seed and her giving put her in front of every man on the planet. 
that honor of being the first eyewitness of the resurrected Christ went to Mary Magdalene. Mm -mm. I want to say this. Your seed has no concern, no interest, no respect for your gender, whether you're male or female. Pastor Stephen, I'm a woman. I, I'm, I'm limited in so many ways. Your seed doesn't know that. Your, when you give your offering to God, your, that offering, that seed, it's going, to, it's going to be multiplied. A harvest is going to come. The seed doesn't even have respect in the sense whether you're male or female. It's going to just do its thing. It's going to go in the ground. It's going to come up, and it's going to multiply what was sown. Mm. So your seed has no interest, no concern, no respect for your gender, whether you're male or female. It has no respect for your skin color or your nationality. It's just going to do, it's going to work. It's going to do its thing. So the type of seed that you sow, there is a place you can break through where you actually establish a memorial. Guess who else did that? Cornelius. Oh, Pastor Stephen, did God, for his harvest, did God give him a pat on the back? Uh, if you call being the first Gentile to be saved, pat on the back, I'd say that's a heavyweight harvest. He went down in history as the first Gentile convert. I guess he was lucky. Maybe he was just chosen by some kind of a lottery that God just happened to choose one. No, it tells you that he prayed often and gave alms. He was giving, 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 giving. And God just said, <laughs> I'm going to give him a harvest that the whole world will know about. All of Christianity will celebrate till the uh, end of time and throughout eternity. And the same way with Mary Magdalene. She, when she broke that alabaster box, God said, that's it. I can't take it anymore. God said, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to put an offering on her that's beyond any financial value. I'm going to put a blessing on her that will be legendary. I'm going to do something for her that will stand throughout eternity as a memorial. And God allowed her to be the first one to see his son after he had been raised from the dead. Mm -mm. She jumped in front. She jumped in front of all the men. She came. Remember, we're talking about a former, very, very immoral woman, a sinner. And here she goes from the back all the way to the front. And that's what a love offering with sacrifice. And just you're you're in it all the way. That's what it'll do for you. You cannot outgive God. You can't outgive Him. He's got, he's got blessings that He wants to release that are reserved for those that know that He's got their heart and they have His. I tell you what, there's some things we're going to see. We're going to see Christian billionaires very, very soon. We're going to see Christian multi-billionaires. And they're not going to be elitist. They're not going to be attending the World Economic Summit. They have zero interest in that. Matter of fact, they despise that. You will not see them at the Hollywood, uh, you know, uh, uh, awards and garbage like that. No, 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 no. They have a heart for God. They have a heart for uh, running away from that which formerly defiled and polluted them, and they are done with that filth forever, and they are going to use their wealth for the funding of the gospel. I have a very, very deep conviction in my heart that I'm talking to some of them right now. Mm -mm -mm. And you feel it coming all over you. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Pastor Stephen, I like it. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'll pray for you, but I also want to encourage you to not just look at Mary Magdalene, but I would encourage you to emulate her actions. Um, this Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. I want you to get your resurrection offering in either on that day, March 31st, or any time before. We've only got a few more days. If I haven't heard from you yet, Get it in, okay? And if you want to bring it in on Sunday, get it in. 
I've got a list of every resurrection seed offering that's coming in. Who sowed it? Who gave it? And I'm praying over every person, every single person. I don't care if it's $5 or $5 billion. I'm looking at it. I'm lifting you before the Lord. And I'm praying that the Mary Magdalene anointing will come on you. The same grace that God gave to her, that fire, that passion, that giving spirit will be on you and God will lift you in the realms of financial wealth that uh, you are the, you are the standard setter. Amen. And when you give, others are like, my God, how can I sit here and be so stingy and greedy <laughs> when somebody is dropping, you know, like when somebody is being so like, uh, almost like, a, um, what's the word, like daring, daring in their giving. And my friends, just a couple of days ago, a person contacted our ministry who had sowed a very deep sacrificial seed into our ministry uh, a, a little while back and uh, literally, literally emptied their account. There was not a penny in their account. They cleared it out and gave everything to the work of the Lord and sowed it into this ministry. And they called and said, everything that we gave, the person said, everything uh, that, that she gave, God has completely given it all back and more. <laughs> God, God filled it all the way back up. You cannot outgive God. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for everybody watching right now that they realize that Jesus, of course, had multiple anointings, but that Mary Magdalene was involved in these anointings, these giving, uh, wild, lavish giving experiences. And I pray, Father, that something of this touch your people in, in their way, in the way that you would have them flow. And I just thank you, Father God, that the blood of Jesus takes care of all sin, takes care of the past, but it also makes us very, very grateful he who has been forgiven much loves much, and she didn't take that for granted. And so I pray, Father, that if there are those who have not yet sown, that you would show them right now what to do, what seed they are to give, and that it would not be a mechanical and like a some kind of like a dry transaction, but there will be love mixed in it, maybe some tears mixed in it because they're giving it to you. They're putting it into your hand as they bring it into this ministry. We thank you, O oh God, that you will be receiving it and that your work will continue to move forward. O oh God, we thank you. We thank you. Now, I pray, Father, for everybody listening right now, that this area of very strange harvest, such as being the first person to see Jesus raised from the dead and having that noted in your eternal word, I thank you, Father, you've got some You've got some harvest that you've been wanting to release, but you've got to have people that are fully committed. I believe you found some. And Father, they're, they're around the world, and they're those that not just follow my ministry, but Father, uh, other, follow other good ministers as well. And we're coming into this time, we're going to begin to see very strange harvest, mind mind-stretching type harvest where people will be like, how in the world did that happen? And Father, it will all be turned to you for your glory. None of it will be held with greedy hands, but your people will know the purpose. So Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're moving right now by your spirit. Touch your people, share with them, show them what to do. And I thank you for their obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Mary Magdalene got it, didn't she? She got her harvest. What was it? First person, first person, jumped in front of the man, jumped in front of everybody. She went from the back to the front. Why? She got her harvest from those incredible love seeds that she sowed. Praise God. My friends, there's, this, this stuff is sowing and reaping. This is not luck or chance. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord. If you're watching today and you don't know Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, uh, but you feel his love and you, you, you know he's calling you. Surrender right now to him. I want, I want to lead you in prayer. He'll save you right now. Just pray this with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. 
I turn from them. Please forgive me. Save me right now. Wash me with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life and step into my life right now and lead me and guide me from this day forward. Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Praise God. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the family of God. Mm, mm, mm. Well, let's take Holy Communion together. Glory to the Lord. Mm, mm, mm. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Mm, mm. Jesus is going to get a hold of some sinner billionaires. He's going to save them. They're going to come to know him as Savior, and they're going to give. But there will be other believers that God will raise up, even out of financial obscurity, and will take them to the stratosphere of wealth. Multimillionaire, billionaire, multibillionaire, and they will be so on fire for God that uh, they wouldn't want them at a Hollywood party. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But not only would they not want to be there, uh, those kind of people wouldn't want you to be there. Why? Too much fire, too much preaching about Jesus. And uh, amen. We're not hiding who we are. All right. Grab some grape juice and some unleavened bread. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread and the juice. We bless it. We thank you that this is now the body and the blood of Jesus. Father, as we receive the Lord's body, we thank you for the receiving grace. We thank you that it's a result of the giving grace. Thank you, Father. Let both, let both be flowing strongly right now. Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we thank you also for uh, end-time assignments. We thank you for uh, wealth uh, flowing into the lives uh, of those that are sold out to you. We thank you, Father. We give you all of the praise. We give you all of the praise. Father, we thank you for those not afraid to break the alabaster jar. Oh, God, we give you praise. When your spirit moves us, we thank you that all of the resources we have are at your command. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Let us now receive the Lord's flesh. Amen. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. It's mighty cleansing power, not only cleansing sin, but also cleansing our conscience so we can have a, a clean conscience. And only you can do that. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's receive. Praise God. Let me put up the giving links on the screen. We're three days out. From Sunday, Resurrection Day, I want to receive your seed. You can mail it in or you can bring it in online. The giving links are now on the screen. Praise the Lord. All you have to do is do what the Holy Spirit is directing you to do. And I will be believing with you for a harvest that only God can give Yes, I believe God to bless you financially and take you higher in those realms, but also for God to bless you in ways that only uh, he could do because it's beyond a human's ability. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your seed. Thank you for the special resurrection offering. I'll be looking for it, praying over them, believing with you again for your harvest. Praise God. Praise God. I tell you what, we are going to take the edifying, faith-building, word-strengthening Bible, Word of God to those who are hungry, and we're going to feed them with the finest of the wheat. Amen. Because people are so hungry for God's Word. And thank you for sending me uh, to the nations of the world. We're on... Uh, 
Holy Land Broadcasting, broadcasting three times, twice on Sunday and also on Monday night, uh, out of Bethlehem to all of Israel. We're also on God TV, which now has a satellite footprint over, well over a billion people. That doesn't mean everybody, of course, is watching at the same time. <laughs> but we are on, uh, you know, that great network, and many people do watch, praise the Lord. And as well, other powerful networks, as well as some other doors that are open in front of us, as well as moving ahead uh, step by step with the 14.5 acres uh, that we will be building the brand new ministry headquarters and television studio at. So thank you. Your giving helps us to move forward on all fronts, and you are causing the Word of God to go all around the world, which is what Jesus said it would the gospel of salvation, as well as stories like Mary Magdalene and her incredible offering that Jesus said would be preached all over the world. Amen. So together, we're putting the word out there, and it is touching the lives of countless people. Thank you so much. All right, I pray that you have a wonderful day. Consider Mary Magdalene. Consider her harvest. I've never seen a harvest like that. And by the way, nobody can ever get that harvest. It was only going to go to one person. And the only way you could get that one was to sow into it. And she did. She qualified. She got it. God's got some very special things on his mind for you. Okay? Till next time, stay strong in the Lord. Bye-bye.